Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 113. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. To support Therapy Chat and get a free month of Audible, go to audibletrial.com slash therapy chat. I love Audible because I can download audiobooks and listen to them while I'm driving. And when I take a long trip, it is a wonderful way to hear a book that I haven't had a chance to read in person. Books that I've enjoyed on Audible recently have been Broken Open by Elizabeth Lesser, Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown, Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff, which I had already read in person, but I liked hearing it read in her voice again, and The Mindful Path to Self-Compassion by Christopher Germer, which I'm currently reading. So once again, if you'd like to get a free month of Audible and a free book and support Therapy Chat at the same time, go to audibletrial.com slash therapy chat. Hey, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today's episode is about the truth of pregnancy and motherhood. My guest today is Melissa DeVaris Thompson, a licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice in New York City. Melissa is a holistic and depth-oriented therapist who supports clients in finding wholeness, mind, body, and spirit, creating more joy, ease, and healthy relationships. She helps her clients remember their empowered, authentic voice and tap back into their true selves. Melissa is also one of the co-hosts of the Honest Mamas podcast, which had not yet been released as of the time we recorded our interview, but it is now live and you can find it at honestmamas.com. I know when I was pregnant, I had a certain image of what pregnancy was supposed to be like, how pregnant women were supposed to feel, and what mothers are like in general, which was really this idealized version of the reality. In other words, it wasn't real. It was idealized. I was supposed to be happy. I was supposed to be feeling good. I was not supposed to complain about how I felt because this is supposed to be a joyful time. And it was a joyful time, but it was also very uncomfortable. There were a lot of fears, surprises, and all of that is real too. So I loved talking with Melissa about how she came to be doing the work that she's doing and how she helps moms along their path of the journey of motherhood. Let's go ahead and listen to my interview with Melissa DeVaris Thompson. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today's conversation is going to be very interesting. I have a guest today who is from New York City, Melissa DeVaris Thompson. Melissa, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so glad that we are doing this. And so you're an LMFT in New York City. Can you just tell our audience more about yourself and the work you've been doing? Absolutely. So I am a transplant from originally South Africa, from Cape Town. My family immigrated to the U.S. and got my training out in California and moved to New York City and set up a private practice uh, where I see mostly women and couples in their 20s and 30s. And because of the background that I have in my own personal experience with mindfulness, meditation, uh, spirituality, some energy healing work, I'm also a Reiki practitioner. Mm. I really started to kind of see if there was a different way to practice psychotherapy, to be as a therapist that felt a little bit more authentic and a little bit more mindful 
And so I started down that path. Going to California was a great way to sort of open that door for me. There's every type of modality you could ever dream of in that aspect out there. Yeah. So I, um, I found the grad school that I went to. And one of my classes, for example, was studying in India, multiculturalism and spirituality. And we traveled to India and it was just such a phenomenal experience that when I opened up my private practice, I decided that, you know, I really want to bring some more of these holistic elements into my work because it's so much of who I am and it's so much of what I see heals and helps people. So I started up, you know, after my move from California to New York, I started up in private practice in New York City and then came another change where I became a mother and I had done so much work. I'd done so many hours of therapy. I have done meditation. I've done dance. I've studied Reiki. I've done all these ways in which you learn the inner landscape of what's happening for you. And when I had my first child, I it completely knocked me onto my butt. Mm. Completely. And I was just having a lot of very overwhelming feelings. I felt very isolated and alone. And I started reaching out to other women that I really trusted and that maybe had had a child a little bit before me that I could say, what is going on? Like, why is this so hard? No one tells you. Everyone prepares you for like the physical aspects of giving birth for this is how it's going to feel in the hospital. This is what an epidural feels like. Mm -hmm. This is what a doula does. This is what a home birth may look like. But nobody prepared me or a lot of my colleagues and friends for what it actually feels like, the transitions that happen emotionally and also spiritually. Mm -hmm. Same, same. Yeah, totally. So I, I got together with two other very, very dear friends, very, very amazing practitioners and healers. They, they too are also in the Reiki field and also licensed psychotherapists. And together we said, you know, what, what can we do that can really help not only ourselves and our clients, but women out there in the world that are feeling all these different feelings that nobody's talking about and everybody is sort of kind of high, not everybody, but yeah. a lot of us kind of hide in a closet somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So we decided to come up with this uh, online company called Honest Mamas and Honest Mamas primarily helps women navigate the spiritual and emotional journey to motherhood. And we address everything from sort of women that are trying to get pregnant, that are having fertility issues, to pregnancy, to labor birth, to surrogacy, to young children, um, transgender issues. Like we really are keeping it a little bit broad because so many things can come up during this very, very fertile, for lack of a better word, period. <laughs> yeah. Fertile in more ways than one. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, you know, for us, we, we want to tell the truth. We want to be authentic and we want to be real. And so that's why we created Honest Mamas. And through that, we've created an e-course, a community, and we're going to be launching a podcast uh, coming up pretty soon. So amazing. So before you even say anything else, let me just ask you to talk about like, what are some of the spiritual changes that a woman can experience with Pregnancy, childbirth, motherhood? It's a great question. I think that the time of pregnancy, childhood, the whole the whole journey is so um is so ripe for a lot to emerge mm. that sometimes women don't even know or aren't aware, including myself, who had, like I said, done a lot of work and yet it still was very, very overwhelming. And so for me, I think it comes back to really priming yourself, preparing yourself, slowing down, getting to know who you are and getting to learn what spirituality means for you. For me, it means mindfulness, visualizations, Reiki, you know, connecting with nature. For somebody else, it may mean going to church. That's how they find themselves. That's how they, you know, find home within themselves. And so when I think about spirituality and I think about helping a woman return back, 
I and my colleagues, we don't want to be afraid of talking about that aspect in fear of like turning some people off, you know, mm-hmm. because I, I think that we all have some sort or sense of spirit or spirituality in whatever way that is. And maybe, maybe there are people out there that are like, absolutely no, nothing else exists. Like this is where I am. And fine. That's, that's great. But our mission is to really help those women, not only maybe for the first time, discover what that is for them, but also how to find that again after they've gone through this huge transition of becoming a mother. Wow. Yeah, that's very powerful. And I'll admit, I'm one of those people who used to be extremely uncomfortable when someone would say spirituality, because I had had a lot of negative interactions with people around, I guess you could say religiosity, where you know, I, I had a lot of um, judgment about what my family's religious practices were when I was growing up and, and a lot of misunderstanding. And so it became like a scary topic. But mm-hmm. now I understand spirituality as more being like, do you feel connected to something larger? You know, mm-hmm. you're, not, you're not just alone in the world, but you're a part of something else. And it could be the human condition, you know, the universe, God, nature, like there's so many different ways that people can express spirituality and what it is and what it feels like for them. But, uh, you know, it's not just religion. And that's what I used to think. Right. And, and when people, that's absolutely right. Like, and then there are people that's maybe swing the other way that are so against religion that, you know, why would you ever go to church? Like, why would you ever read Mm -hmm. the Bible, you know? And to us and to me, it feels like whatever works, you know, (laughs) come back to whatever works for you. Find what works for you. Find your community, your tribe in the way that you start. The the main purpose for us and for me that I help my clients do is really find their authentic voice, what that really sounds like and how to translate that into the world. Beautiful. So I want to go back to this topic of how motherhood can really, and the whole experience around motherhood can really cause things to emerge that are very unexpected. I know, as you said about being prepared physically for what happens during childbirth. Yeah. I mean, I have two children, so I was prepared physically, even when they talk about like during labor, the, I mean, I had read a lot and they said during the stage of transition, you can feel a lot of emotions, but I never would have thought that it would have been the emotions that I felt. Mm. (laughs) And if I hadn't just had at least a piece of information to say, oh, this is the transition stage, I probably would have thought I was going crazy, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it was terrifying and, um, or, you know, just like, so, scary to lose control in that way and not knowing what was happening. And as someone who works with survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse, I've learned, and this was after I became a mother, that childbirth can be an extremely traumatic, triggering experience for survivors of sexual violence, which makes total sense. Mm -hmm. But nobody tells people that. Mm -mm. No, nobody tells people that. And I also think For me, I guess where I would start by saying is that it's so, I think it starts at kind of understanding and knowing what you've been through, really doing the work, going to therapy, talking to a trusted friend, taking walks in nature, finding quietness and stillness in, in a, in a pace and a, and with somebody that you trust and that you know can hold however big the magnitude of your trauma is. Because if you go through childbirth and having a child with trying to kind of lock this up into a closet, it will find you in some way. It will it will come out in some way. And I think that it comes out in a way that is way more overwhelming and forceful than if you can at some point in your life, whether it's before. I mean, there's never like a, oh, it's too late situation. It's sort of like whenever you get to that point that you're willing to kind of turn inside and start to understand your trauma, it can really benefit you not only being in labor and going into birth with absolutely does re-traumatize a lot of women, 
but also having a child and navigating that journey. Exactly. Childbirth is just the start. And not to mention the trauma that can happen during childbirth, even if you're not a survivor of any other trauma before. Yes. Um, yes. Childbirth itself can be traumatic. And you know, it's interesting. I, I've sort of made this kind of feeling I've been talking a lot about lately, whether it's with clients or, you know, in our podcast or through Honest Mamas around this whole idea of an empowered birth mm-hmm. and how you find your voice and how you find your power going through the process of motherhood and getting, getting pregnant. And for me, I'll sort of make it a little personal because I think it's helpful to share. Like I said, my first, my first child was, you know, it was, it was a fine pregnancy. And then I wanted a natural birth and I read all the books and I took classes and I really prepared myself. I will not have a C-section. I will not have a C-section. It's going to be unmedicated. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be, I'm just going to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't happen, when I was rushed into an emergency C-section and I was fully medicated with drugs. I don't even know what the names are at this point. I do obviously later on, I, I learned, but in the moment it was so terrifying and I felt so much guilt that I remember when my son came out and it actually makes me a little teary now. When my son came out after the C-section, they delivered him. I really just felt like I had failed him. Mm. This was my first thing I could have done to protect my child and I failed him. And that was a huge, huge eye opener for me. And I went into the recovery room and I cried and I cried and I cried. And I just felt that people around me, like the, the nurses, of course, they were trying to do the best they could and, and, you know, be as patient and loving, but no one was really there to hold space for me. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, because of people that aren't therapists, what I mean by that is someone just to sit with me and maybe hold my hand or not, and just allow me to shed the grief, to cry, to be able to be in process, to move it out of my body so that I don't hold on to it for years and years and years and years. And there was nobody in that first birth experience for me. And even my providers, I feel like the communication breakdown happened And I feel like in a lot of ways, I left feeling very confused, very overwhelmed, which I know is kind of first time motherhood too. But no one along the journey said, how are you doing? How was that for you? Like, how are you feeling? You know, it was sort of feed the baby. This is how you breastfeed. And I understand there's a huge place for that too. You've got to make sure the mother's healthy and the baby's healthy, of of course. But I wish there was a step further than that. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they weren't able to be attuned to and attend to your emotional experience that you were obviously having. Right. And, you know, there's so much discomfort with people having emotions, you know? Yes. Yes. And that was, that's sort of a little backstory to my, why I became a therapist because I grew up in a family and in a culture where, you know, feelings really aren't prioritized. It was sort of, all right, get on with it, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and move on which in some moments, absolutely, that is actually very helpful and at times therapeutic. But what draw me, what drew me to this work was that I had a therapist way, way back in the day who actually cared about me. And I know that sounds so weird, but they actually cared about me and they showed some emotion when I was sharing something very deep and very moving. I just felt their presence and I felt their tenderness and their care. And I thought, oh my God, this is like life. It was life changing for me, life changing. And it was that moment I decided to become a therapist because that is what I so desperately wanted in the world. And, and getting that allowed me to heal so many parts of myself, just somebody holding space and caring and listening very deeply. That's so powerful. And as a therapist, it's so, it's such a great reminder that what we're doing, what that holding space really is, that is a therapeutic intervention in itself. You know how we're like thinking, oh, what do I do next? What's my next right. tool to use? You know, and right. it's like, just hold space. That can be the most powerful thing if someone has never experienced that, just to be witnessed. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah, a thousand it's percent. so beautiful. And then, you know, that goes to, obviously... 
attachment, the whole story you told of no one helping you in the way that you needed to be helped. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. for, For moms who go through that experience at birth, when they give birth, you know, that can be an attachment like wounding and opening up prior attachment wounding, I'm sure. Completely. And it, and it extends, you know, for me, it extended into the postpartum room at the hospital where doctors are making choices for me. And I, I didn't know what they were talking about. And I wasn't given a full explanation. I was talked to very quickly and curtly. And I felt completely insignificant, unpowerful, like I, like I didn't matter. And I remember somebody said to me, you know, when you have, when you go through giving labor, whether you have a C-section of vaginal birth, you know, particularly a C-section, because this was my experience, they said, you know, everyone brings, you know, flowers and, you know, happy thoughts and cards because you had a baby, but no one brings you like a, you just had surgery card, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like, we just forget that, you know, or, or when you even have a vaginal birth, like you just kind of forget how hard it is for the mom. Um, and so kind of going back to this, this feeling of wishing and wanting, I'm telling you one day I'm going to create it. A, a person that comes in after you give birth, that just is there. Like it's like a wise elder, you know, that just yeah. holds space and allows you to cry and doesn't put you in a box of like, Oh, now we have a problem, but just allows you to grieve and move through all the feelings and thoughts you had around your birth, around what was there, what wasn't there. If you have, I mean, and that's a healthy birth. I'm, you know, think of all the things that happen or that yeah. could happen in births that aren't healthy. Yeah. All the variations on the way you expect and hope birth will go. Right. Right. Absolutely. So that, that is definitely a very large reason why Honest Mamas came about in simply just saying, I'm here with you. I, I understand there's nothing wrong with you. This is normal human emotion. It's okay to grieve, even though you just had a baby and everyone's super excited. It's okay to not feel connected to your baby. It's okay to sort of hate the mothering thing at moments. You know, that's all normal. And I just, I think as a culture, we're getting better talking about those subjects, but there's so much more work to do. So much. And there's so much shame around not feeling the way you think you're supposed to feel about parenthood, about, you know, raising kids, about losing some autonomy and kind of losing the ability to just kind of do whatever you want, all the responsibility that comes with parenting. And plus that attachment piece, like feeling shame about not feeling as happy about it as you think you should or something. And because I work with, you know, younger women, I sort of see them go through when they first meet their partner and when they get engaged and when they get married and how much stuff comes up in that period of time. And yet I'm telling you, no one has told them that they may not feel 100% happy on their wedding day or during their engagement or that period because it is such again, a very tumultuous time potentially of identity loss or change. You're leaving your kind of biological family to go Mm -hmm. join with another family. What does that mean? I'm now, you know, shacked to this person for the rest of my life. What if I don't like them? What if this quality annoys me? So that to me is sort of where the journey begins in a way. In other ways it doesn't, but, but that's a big, big piece And then around the part around having a child is definitely like a huge other kind of awakening and um, potentially disruptive time. Yeah. And we have so many hopes and expectations tied up into becoming a mother or becoming parents that, you know, it's all going to be so joyful. And Mm -hmm. there are so many joyful parts about being a parent, but it's not all joyful. And it's not all easy. No, not at all. Not at all. And there are moments where I feel like, gosh, I've done so much work around this, like one particular thing that I cannot stand about myself. And here it is again. And then it's like, not only have I done the thing that I said I wouldn't do or said the thing that I said I wouldn't say, 
whether it's getting frustrated with my child, I'm like, okay, I really need to work on that. And then it happens again. And I'm like, oh gosh, then it's all the disappointment. Then it's the judgment. And then it's this lovely thing that I call mom guilt, which I know many of your listeners have heard Mm -hmm. about, maybe have talked about, but it is real. Mom guilt is real. Well, tell me more about mom guilt. How do you define that? Mom guilt is anything. You know, when you become a mother, it's, I mean, I don't know what it is. All of a sudden, it's like every decision you make, well, was that the right one? Am I sure? I, you want to, it's like this mama bear comes out and you want to protect your child. And that is such a beautiful, amazing, amazing quality and, and what we want, right? But there is this aspect of trying to, you know, a lot of women try to do it all. They're still, you know, working. They're trying to be a mother. They're trying to be a good partner. They're trying to function in the world. And it's a big, huge job to become a mother. And so inevitably along the way, whether you're working or not working, married or not married, you're going to drop the ball. You're going to do something you're not proud of or happy about. You're going to feel embarrassed in front of people when your child is having a complete meltdown and screaming and crying because, you know, that's never happened to me ever. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And you're going to start feeling I'm not good enough. I made the wrong decision. No one likes me or my child. You know, how could I make that decision? Like the, the guilty, shamed part of you will inevitably emerge when you become a mother. Yeah. There's so many things that just pop up. It's like those issues you thought you dealt with, or I would say for you, it sounds like you were a very enlightened mom to be, and you had already done a lot of therapy work before you became a mom. Me? No, I really it was all surprises. Yeah. Oh, and man. <laughs> so everything that popped up was like, huh? And mm. um, I even remember when I was in, So I didn't finish college, you know, I didn't go 18 to 22 or whatever. I, I kind of stopped and started. So when I went back, I was 29 to finish my bachelor's and I started, this is how I started in the mental health field. I started first as a volunteer in a sexual assault crisis center. And then I ended up working there even while I was working on my bachelor's and wow, uh, yeah, it was awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Mm. But they told us you, if you're going to do this kind of work, it's going to trigger every issue you have. So you yes. need to figure out what they are. Yes. And so I literally, I don't know if this every, any therapist listening has ever experienced this, but I literally was that person who went into therapy and I was like, well, I'm here because I need to find out what my issues are. <laughs> the therapist <laughs> is like, well, what do you think they are? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I was just like, (laughs) I have no idea. And it's funny because I'm a pretty insightful and self-aware person. Now I'm 45, but I didn't know if I had any, but I wanted, I was open to figuring out what they were, but I had no connection to, it might be this, it might be that, nothing. Well, that Laura, I think that's such a perfect segue to kind of Number one, awesome, brave job you went in and you were like, okay, I think there's something, but I'm not sure. Can you help me? And I have had clients come in and say the same thing. And I, I actually love it because I think it's, it is a very brave move to come to therapy and to say, okay, I want to do some inner work and I'm just not sure what's there. Yeah. And that can be really scary and overwhelming. But I think the the piece that, you know, as you go through this work and as you sort of you know, for me, the the way that I did it or the way that kind of brought me and brings me the most peace and calm is through mindfulness and through meditation. And, you know, I've practiced yoga for many, many years and I love being in nature. Mm-hmm. And I think in those moments, it's so important to know, you know, to get quiet and to, to start to feel. I also work very somatically. So we talk a lot about the body and we kind of go inside. I ask my clients sometimes if they'll just close their eyes and they stay in the chair and I stay in the chair and I guide them through a little bit of a relaxation exercise where they drop the tension from their jaw and from their shoulders and let the energy kind of move into their abdomen and allow it to relax. And, and then I sort of ask them, you know, what are you noticing in this moment? 
And for somebody that hasn't done a lot of psychotherapy work may say, well, I don't know. Okay, great. Let's work with that, you know? And so we, we deepen the process and inevitably someone will say, oh, I'm, I'm actually feeling some tightness in my stomach. And I'll say, awesome, great noticing, You're feeling tight. What does that feel like? And with the visualizations that I use, I often say, you know, is there, this may sound weird, but is there a color or a sound or an image you get as you kind of bring your attention to this area of tightness and tension in your stomach? What do you notice? And it may not make sense. So just go with whatever bubbles up and keep your eyes closed as you tell me what it is. And it's a very, very deep moment to moment process and in how to work and really uncover and discover what it is you're feeling. So when you're in the moment, you know, like for me, when I'm my second fast forward to my second child, where I felt like, no, okay, my mission here is to have an empowered birth where I feel better about the situation, no matter how it turns out. And I really started to fall back on a lot of the mindfulness and meditation exercises like that, where I sort of, you know, just kind of go inside for a moment and kind of do a little bit of a scan and check in with myself on how I'm feeling so that I can get really clear. And then from that, articulate my needs and what I, what I need and what I want. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And so, I mean, I, it's, It really relates to what I was saying before, too, because I was very disconnected from my body at that time. You know, if you ask me what I was feeling, what I noticed in my body, what I was sensing, I wouldn't know. I would have no Mm -hmm. idea. And I mean, even remember when I was pregnant, you know, and this is this was like five years before the time when I first started going to therapy. But I remember when I first felt the baby move, I was like was that and that was the Mm -hmm. first time I realized that I could feel something in my body like as an adult because yeah because I used to you know feel my body I'm sure when I was a child but whenever I got good at blocking out my emotions you know so I remember it it was being pregnant that helped me to become a little bit more mindful about my body but I still was very unaware of what what emotions I was feeling, even though I was good at talking about emotions, I knew how to name them, but I didn't know how to feel them. Yes. And that, that is such an interesting, so interesting that you said that because I was also thinking a lot about how, you know, there's like kind of like a a process where, and it's probably, this is just my own theory Mm -hmm. in working with clients and myself is that people come in they're like, I don't know how I'm feeling. Okay, great. We can work with that. So we work with that. And slowly but surely through different ways, they start learning, okay, maybe I'm feeling some anger now. Okay. And then they start beginning, they start becoming way more aware of their feelings. And then I was just thinking about this before we we got on the call today on the, on the um, conversation today is that it almost becomes like a little bit of purgatory. Like you're kind of like, okay, I don't know if you've experienced this with people, you know, or yourself, like, okay, now I'm aware. I know that I'm having this emotion. I know where it lives in my body. I know how it kind of manifests and and where it comes from. Now, what do I do with it? Yeah. You know, how do I move it out of here? How do I get rid of it? How do I, you know, and so it is, it is such a process, you know, kind of coming back to how it is you feel. And that's where you start. That is where you start. You notice that kick in your belly and you're like, oh my gosh, I have a body. I have a stomach. That kick, what does that feel like? Yeah. Yeah. And so in your practice, are you... When you're working with emotions in the body, are you focused on helping people get rid of the feelings they notice there? Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Which is why probably no one will come back to see me after they hear this podcast. (laughs) So I have there's a I think it's a Rumi quote. Rumi is an old um an old poet. And he, there's a quote, what's in the way is the way. Mm, Yeah. And there's a, there's a way that's sort of become my motto as I work with people. And trust me, I want to escape my feelings too sometimes. Absolutely. Like that's just human. And I think in moments, I don't know if you would agree, Laura, but I think in moments we need to learn how to kind of turn down the volume and like go see a funny movie or go take a hike and like not be introspecting so much because it's 
too overwhelming. You know, it hits a point where it's like, okay, enough. Like, let's take a little break. Let's titrate. Yeah. And come back in a moment. So I do, you know, I, I, I do work that way with my clients and really trying to uncover how they're feeling. And I think what's so powerful about therapy is that when you've got somebody to work with that you trust, and that takes time to build that trust and who's present and they're paying attention and they're non-judgmental and they're really here with you, kind of like the person I want, you know, in the bedside after I've given birth, that's, that's kind of the person I'm talking about is that, you know, in the therapy room, many people will say like, okay, can you just make it go away? Can you make it escape? But I think the most powerful, I know the most powerful way to move this energy, whether it's anger, frustration, fear, sadness, you know, you name it, is to really be able to learn how to tolerate it and to really be able to learn how to be with it. And that is the whole premise of mindfulness meditation, noticing when the feelings come in, noticing when they go out and how to be with them so that they don't obliterate you. Yes. Since you were talking about the energy, how does your Reiki, being a Reiki master, how does that influence your perspective on therapy and and the way you work? Oh, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it informs so much of how I work and how much I, you know, move in the world and, and yet it's so subtle. So, you know, for me, I see a lot of things as energy. I think I, I see emotions as energy. When people cry, I see it as a release of energy and a moving through of energy. And so in the state of New York, where I am, uh, there are a lot of kind of rules to follow when you're a licensed practitioner, which I am. And so I, you know, I'm going to be moving into more of a realm of being able to hold the Reiki piece along with the psychotherapy. I'm, I'm sort of discovering how that's going to look. But all my clients, for the most part, know that I'm a Reiki practitioner. Most of them have heard of Reiki or perhaps are interested in it. And when we do a lot of the visualizations, you know, with their permission, I sort of offer some Reiki energy from across the room through my hands. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's really, for me, it's really about being present and a lot about intuition and how I feel. So to me, the energy comes up in ways of like, oh, wow, I'm having this really strong emotion within myself. I'm going to name it. Is this true for you, client? Like, is this what you're noticing and how validating that can be for them? Yes, absolutely. I'm not alone in the world. Like you understand, you get it. Yeah, I was sort of feeling that like as you were sitting there and talking about this thing or sort of as you went inside, I just got this big wave of X, Y, or Z. And as a therapist in my own practice, I'm learning still on the journey to learning and really owning that I feel these things. We all feel these things. Yeah. And how do we become brave enough to say them? Yeah. I think what you said about what you notice happening in your body when you're in a session with a client, I think when you have a client who's really disconnected from their body, like in their emotions, the way I used to be, Mm. it's you, you can help sense what they're feeling that they may not be able to really tap into or name until you name it. And then they go, wow, that's just what's happening. You know? Exactly. Yes. Yes. And it makes somebody, like I said before, I think it undoes aloneness. You know, that's sort of a, a model. There's a model of psychotherapy that I've been studying for years. It's called AEDP. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know, <laughs> yeah. I'll ask you more about that later because okay. there's somebody else I've had on who was big into AEDP too. And she's yeah. in New York. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. There's the, the main woman who created Diana Fosha is in New York. So it's really, I mean, they talk a lot about undoing aloneness and how to really be with somebody in a way that there is that trust built that they can go to these scary places and they can move through, not around, not above, not below, kind of moving through the trauma and the emotions. And one of their other kind of pieces that I often hold on to through AADP is one of the the teachers says, you know, this, the slower we go, the faster we move. Oh, I believe that so much. 
Yes. Yeah. It's phenomenal work. Yeah. And in therapy, especially when there's trauma or a lot of anxiety, which often is rooted in trauma as well, there can be that sense of urgency and like, hurry up. When are we, when are we going to get like, when are we going to start doing this? When are we gonna, pro, let's, let's start processing. I'm ready to do, you know, and it's like, yes, we have to pace it at the right pace. We just, it is, it's like the faster the person feels like we need to go, the more we need to slow it down because that's, that's, you know, information. It's information. And that's where healing happens because when generally speaking, and I live in New York and everybody is fast and furious and quick and, you know, this people want a lot of times, including myself at moments, a quick fix, a quick Mm -hmm. answer, a quick diagnosis, a quick assessment. And the faster that people go, like you were saying, generally speaking, like you said, the slower we need to go, because that is what generally we are avoiding when we go fast. Yes, yes, We're, yes. we're avoiding, we're avoiding the feeling. And so I remember working with, oh my gosh, my therapist who I absolutely adore and love. And, and I would tell her, be telling her some part of, you know, what was happening in my life back then. And, and she would look at me and she'd say, Melissa, can we just pause for a moment? Can we just, I know, I noticed something there. I noticed there was like some, 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 you know, kind of redness in your cheeks when you just mentioned that one thing, or I saw some tears. Can we just slow down? Like, what, what do you notice right now? Like what, what's happening? And for me in that moment, you know, there, we got to a point where I'd say, oh my gosh, you're doing it again. You're, you're doing that <laughs> therapy thing again. But that's how I work now because I realized how transformational that is, is to be able to notice those little nuances when we start to feel something or when we brush over something or we're in dialogue with somebody and we're saying to ourselves or feeling within ourselves, oh, I, I just, there's something I'm not saying or there's something I'm feeling. And yet we're trying to have, it's almost like there are two of us. Like there's the part that's having the conversation and kind of keeping up with the normalcy of that. And then there's a part of us that's like completely freaking out on the inside mm-hmm. and how to, how to be able to deal with that. And I think therapy absolutely helps you deal with that. Yes. So much, so much. And when I go to my therapist now and I find my eyes start filling with tears as I'm telling something that I'm trying to be really mechanical in my telling and (laughs) I feel the tears (laughs) start to well up and my therapist always says what's happening right now. And I'm always like, oh, darn it. I I don't want to talk about that part. I know. I know. Some clients say that to me too. And I'm like, look, you pay me to track you. I'm a tracker. I notice things. And sometimes it is too much. And, you know, there are those clients that I know. And even for myself, I've experienced where you just feel like you're in the hot seat too much. And so it's also, there is wisdom in learning as a clinician or even as a friend, a person in the world, like when to kind of back off a little and when to give a little bit of space. Yeah you know, to the process, because it it can feel at times a little invasive, you know, oh, I just noticed you did this. Oh, I just noticed you did that, you know, or what's coming up right now. It can be so vulnerable when you're not used to anyone paying that close attention like that. Yes. A thousand percent. And at the same time, it's so healing. Yes. Right. Right. For some image right now, I'll just trust that. For some for some reason, I just get an image of like a sun and like when the sun's beaming on you, sometimes it burns and sometimes it feels really nice and warm. Mm. And and for me in my practice, I'm looking for the warm. I'm not looking for the burn. I want the warmth and the opening up. Yeah. And not burning and blistering. <laughs> exactly. 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 Well, I there's one more point I want to ask you about, which is your website is named embracingjoy.com, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking about how Brene Brown says, like, you don't get to experience the joyful emotions without, you know, feeling also the, the ones that you don't like. Mm-hmm. And she says, numb the dark and you numb the light. Mm-hmm. And that really feels like to me that it resonates with what you're talking about and the, and the way you're talking about practicing if one is to be able to cultivate joy. Absolutely. And I, I often tell clients that there, to me also, there is a direct correlation with how much you can feel. I kind of use, you can't see it because this isn't a video, but you, how much you can feel on the left hand kind of sinking down to the earth. That's sort of the more primal, heavier emotions, sadness, anger, 
depression, anxiety, how much you can feel that is a direct correlation to, in my image, if you saw me now on the right hand, which is kind of going up to the sky, the joy, the happiness, the, um, the freedom, the freedom. Mm. And I completely agree with that. So when, when my clients are in and myself too, when I'm, I'm in those moments, those times of like deep, dark struggle, I know and I trust that there is so much light coming and so much freedom coming because we're facing, we're turning around and we're facing what scares the heck out of us. It no longer haunts us. It no longer follows us in the same way. Yes, it might be with you forever because it is part of your life and your story and your experience. We're not getting rid of that. But in my practice and in myself, I, I'm learning to be able to navigate it in a way that's not so scary and in a way that I can feel kind of freed up so that I can have more joy in my life. And that's that's sort of coming back to how I created the, the website name actually came to me in a dream. I was really mm. sitting with, you know, what should I name my website? And a lot of therapists name it their names, you know, Melissa Devars, Thompson.com. And I thought, oh, I just, you know, maybe it wasn't the best PR move, but I felt like, you know, I just embracing joy and it's embracing. It's sort of coming back to, we're not going to be there forever in a solid permanent state of joy. We fall off, we get connected again. We fall off, we go away we do some work, we come back again. And that's to me what life is, is, is constantly this fluctuation between feeling and being in the darker shadowy material and then popping out, even if it's for a moment to feel the light, which I often hear my clients say is gratitude even, you know, oh, I just felt so grateful or, oh, I just noticed, you know, the grass today, it was just so green or, oh, a friend called and they want to have lunch, you know, little things that really tune you in and, and tap you on to the joy aspect. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Melissa, can you tell our listeners where they can find all of the things you're doing? Is it on your website? Yes. So I'm on my website's www.embracingjoy.com. And that's where you can find some information about me and my private practice in New York City. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. And if you want more information on Honest Mamas, you can just go to honest, www.honestmamas, M-A-M-A-S.com. And will they find your podcast at honestmamas.com? Yes, they will. When we launch in the fall. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be able to talk about all these topics we talked today about today and branch them out even more and talk to other people in the field. It's really such a passion of mine and my two colleagues. So we're thrilled to launch. Wonderful. Well, I can't wait. I'll be listening. I think it's a much needed resource. And um, I know that many of my clients will find it useful, too. So I'll be telling them all about it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Melissa Devaris Thompson. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. I think she is incredible and her podcast, Honest Mamas, really rocks. Also, she has an e-course. She and the Honest Mamas team have put together this e-course for helping moms who are not feeling connected with their true selves to have practices to improve that. So you can check it all out on her website at honestmamas.com. Don't forget, if you love Therapy Chat, download the app from iTunes for free and have all the episodes organized together in one place. And I would love for you to join us on Facebook in the Therapy Chat Podcast Facebook group. Go to facebook.com and look for Therapy Chat Podcast in groups and you can request to join. There's a few steps to follow, including signing up for my email list so that you can become a member. But in our group, we communicate more directly. Um, you can meet other listeners and we're going to have Facebook Lives and Q&As it's small right now and still growing. So there's space for you. I hope you'll join us. And one last reminder for today, please remember that if you would like to support Therapy Chat, 
and get a free month of Audible with a free book, go to audibletrial.com slash therapy chat, audibletrial.com slash therapy chat. You'll get a free month of Audible where you can download all your favorite books in audiobook format, and you'll get a free book when you use this link and you support Therapy Chat at the same time. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.